Hey everybody, welcome to LTG Live. It's just me today, at least for right now. Uh, my amazing co-host Peter is having some technical issues and he has been trying to get in here for the last couple minutes and he's just Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. So uh, we're hoping that he finds a, a, a good spot and he can join me uh, in just a minute because we definitely want him to be a part of, of LTG Live today as well as today's broadcast. Hey, if you're just tuning in, We'd love to know who you are. Uh, drop your name uh, in the uh, in the chat. Tell us where you're watching from. We're gonna have an incredible conversation today. It'll be different than anything we've done because uh, there'll be multiple voices that are gonna speak into this uh, incredibly important issue. Um, and I see some of you jumping in right now. Carrie, how you doing, my friend? Good to see you, Dylan, Eric. Uh, Quentin, a bunch of you already. Um, but this is LTG Live. Uh, this is our podcast. It also goes to our YouTube channel. So if you don't catch it live, you can catch it on the podcast. You can also check it uh, out on the YouTube channel. We're going to post links for all those things throughout the show so you can find those easily. Um, this is sponsored by Lead the Generation. Chris McNanny, I see you, man. Great to have you on today. Um, and man, we're going to have an important conversation today. Obviously, something that uh, generationally has been a very important conversation, not just important because of what's happening in our nation right now, but uh, important and has been for many, many generations. And so I'm excited for the guests that are going to be with us today. So many of you logging on. Erica, I see you. Uh, Brianna, shout out to you. Uh, excited you're with us. Um, and I'm excited for the two guests that we have invited to come on to uh, the stream today. We're going to jump right in because I know I know you want to get into the topic and you want to be a part of that conversation. And let me just say this before I uh, introduce our guests, we want you to be a part of the conversation. How do you do that? Um, when this conversation gets rolling, go ahead and put your thoughts, put your comments in the chat ask your questions. We will we will get to as many questions as we can. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want you to be able to engage with us. And so that's a big part of what we do on LTG Live. So let me introduce the first of our guests. Um, she is a great friend of mine, has been for years. She has been a part of every Lead the Generation conference uh, in multiple roles, leading worship, doing breakouts, doing hosting, a great friend, and uh, I believe has a, a great anointing on her life. A great young leader, uh, originally from Detroit. Would you please welcome everybody? Kind of give her a welcome in the chat. Diamond DeYamper. Diamond, we are so glad that you're with us. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing so good. I uh, am happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. I, I feel like this is cool. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. Any anytime I get to have a conversation with Diamond, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. You know, this is great. And uh, I, I, you know, my wife and I just love you dearly. We think the world of you, and we're honored um, to to call you and consider you a spiritual daughter. And so um, yeah. we're we're so glad uh, that you're with us. So it's really great. Thank um, you. Thank so you. hey, listen, I I just I see that uh, my my amazing co-host has has like he's figured it out. So Yay, go ahead. Peter. Let's get Peter in. Hey, there you are, bro. What's up? Yes. Yes, Dude, you made it. I don't know what's going on, but this is the only place in the church right here that I can find Wi-Fi. I was like, this is going to be okay. And then it just went crazy, obviously, like 10 minutes before. So, you know, that's how it is. Oh my goodness. Okay. So you sound like you're in a cave right now. So I don't know if your AirPods are working or not. Maybe, maybe you can double check them, but we're, you just, you look great. And so we're excited about that. You know, I mean, come goodness, on. yeah, look really, That's really good. That's my friend so, right there. Yeah, That's my come on. friend, Peter come on. Hey, on. shout out to some people that are coming on. Uh, Hans, I see you, man. Brianna, my wife, my wife, she, she's got five hearts. I think all of those are for you, Diamond. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure those are all for you. I love you, Julie so, Okay. So we have another guest who is near and dear to my heart as well. And uh, it's it's my father. We've never brought him on LTG Live before, but I wanted to bring him on today um, because uh, many people don't realize this, but my dad has over 30 years of lead pastor experience in two different inner city churches, one in Pittsburgh where I was raised and then one in Philadelphia. And so here's what Peter and I were thinking. We were thinking... Young black leader in Diamond, a uh, profound voice for this generation, recently had a Facebook post that went viral in response to all this. And then I thought, boy, let's bring in an older 
white lead pastor with a ton of inner city experience who has been a part of this struggle as well. And uh, this is just going to be an amazing conversation. So everybody, please welcome my father, John Holt to yeah, LTG Live. Dad, how you doing? <laughs> Yeah, I'm the I'm the old white lead pastor. <laughs> <laughs> so this is good. This is good. And listen, um, so here here are the rules for our conversation. There are none, right? I mean, other than the rules of loving and, and being gracious to one another and listening well, the normal things that we all should be doing as believers and followers of the Lord, right? Um, but other than that, no topic is off limits. Um, and uh, we're just excited that we have relationship on this call and uh, we can we can trust one another and we can just have a conversation, which is just really, really good. So um, Diamond and Peter, I see you guys are muted. You can feel free to leave yourself unmuted if there's no background noise. But if you need to control that, you go ahead and do what you got to do. Perfect. And, yeah, I got um, the mic up close. I'm ready to go. Oh, you sound so much better. You sound so Okay, you sound so much better. All right, good. So, Diamond, I want to I want to start with you. Right. And, um, you know, we, we basically said, hey, today we're going to have conversations on racism. Right. And, um, you know, you and I have been good friends for years. You've been good friends with Peter for years. And I know that you, you know, my father, not as well as you know me, but, you know, my father as well. Um, recently, I think it was just a week ago, you um, you posted something that I read on Facebook that I just thought, boy, that was so well said, so well spoken. Peter, I see you nodding your head. I'm sure mm -hmm. that you you saw it as well. And so I, I wanted to base a lot of our conversation today off of some things in your Facebook post. One of the reasons I really loved it was because um, it was not just profound, but it was also very practical. Like you, you did what I felt a lot of, um, you know, the posting that's been going on lacks in, and that is like, how, what do I do? Like, how, how do I or we as church leaders respond? Right. Um, and so I thought you gave like some really great kind of step by step things there. For those of you, you know, go find Diamond's Facebook post. Maybe we'll throw a link in there uh, on the chat for you, but you can go find it. You can you can read through that. So we're just going to jump right into the conversation. No icebreakers, Peter. No. Who's your favorite basketball player? Who's your favorite? Right. We're just like we're just jumping right here. We go. Are we ready? So. Um, so, so Diamond, you mentioned something in your Facebook post, and, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of set you up and let you unpack it a little bit. Um, okay. You mentioned, you know, the idea of the phrase, I don't see color, right? And, and you, just, you just talked about that briefly. It was just kind of something you hit, but I wanted to give you a chance to unpack that for us. And then obviously, Peter, you can feel free to, to jump in and, and dad as well, you know, your, your thoughts on this particular phrase that, quite frankly, a lot of people use or a lot of white people use as a way at times, I think, to, to try to say racism isn't an issue for me. I don't see color. I feel like that's often the context in which it is used. Uh, Diamond, talk to us about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for saying that, all that nice stuff. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, I think there are a lot of well-meaning people. Usually it's well-meaning people that will make a statement like, I don't see color. And I think what they're, um, what they're trying to say is they're trying to say that they see people according to their humanity, you know, or, or, mm. or statements like, we all bleed the same color, we all bleed red, you know. And I think it comes from a place of just wanting to level everybody out and make everybody, um, it comes from a heart maybe of equality or from a heart of equity for people when they make statements like this. However, it's incredibly dangerous because mm -hmm. for one, I want you to see that I'm a black woman. Hmm. I love being a black woman. I don't want you to see around that. I don't want you to see past it. I don't want you to see through it. Um, I don't want you to compartmentalize or try to separate my heritage and my culture from my humanity because they're supposed to, they, they make me up and every other person of color that I know, every other person who is not a person of color. Um, and so it's damaging because there's a meme going around right now, or it's not really a meme, but it's a graphic going around right now that I think depicts this really well. Uh, if you can't see color, you also can't see patterns. You know, if you can't if you can't look at people and be able to see them wholly um, in a whole sense, 
you lose the opportunity not only to see uh, the beauty in our differences, but you lose the ability to see what's real. And that is racial inequality because it is real. So like if you're one person and you don't see color, what you're essentially saying is, I'm not gonna acknowledge reality. I'm not gonna acknowledge that you are a different color than me and I'm not gonna acknowledge that you've had a different experience. So I just wanna appeal to the well-meaning people out there who have used that statement because what they're trying to say is we're all human, um, but you know, don't reduce me to a bag of cells. Like hmm. I, I, I love being <laughs> black. Um, <laughs> I, I love being different. I love yeah. our culture. I love our music. I love our food. Um, yeah. I love our heritage. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if you've said that in the past, don't feel guilty. You know, don't get all sad on me. Just maybe correct your language going forward and say, instead of saying, I don't see color, say, you know, I see that you're different um, than, than me. I see that we have a different experience. I'd love to learn more about that. That's way more powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Peter, Dad, either one of you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, you know it, it's it's pe people who say that are trying to trying to make the conversation or the situation feel at ease and uh, create some some space so they can stretch a little bit. I don't see color, you know. I, I've heard we turn off the lights. We don't know who's who in this room, and I'm like, wow, okay, <laughs> that's strange. Um, but but I, but I think I I think what is more uncomfortable but is beneficial is to say, I see color and I celebrate you. Um, hmm. I, I think hmm. un being uncomfortable is the only way we grow. And in context of obviously being in the gym, you lift heavier weight so that you can expand your muscles so that your muscles break down, they come back together, they grow. Uh, it's yeah. the same thing to say, hey, I see you, I notice your differences. And even though they make me a little bit uncomfortable because maybe I'm, I'm growing through uh, things that my parents didn't understand, I'm growing past what my family presented to me, it makes me feel uncomfortable, but I'm learning how to celebrate who you are. That's why that state is so it's so difficult and uh it, it minimizes and marginalizes black people i think when you say i don't see color because you're saying i don't see you i love what you said Doug, for who you really are i don't see the pattern in in, in your in your uh expression or in your ability and I, I think it's really important to to not say i don't see it but that i do see it i see you and i love the way you look yeah. i love how you're different from me and i realize by knowing you and by experiencing something different I'm a better person. So that, those are kind of my it. thoughts surrounding that. So good. So dad, I'm going to let you jump in here in a second. Um, I, I just want to put this one comment up from Erica because I just thought it was so great. She says, um, in response to you, Diamond, she says, I grew up in a diverse military town, all skin colors. And I have used that statement, but I never meant it in a bad way. I love that we all have different skin colors and it's beautiful. Thank you, Diamond. You know, and uh, and to me, that just that's one of the reasons why Diamond, I wanted to a to ask you to be a part today because I feel like what you're saying is is so practical and so helpful for again well-meaning people. Yeah. Um, Dad, jump in. You know, any any thoughts you want to add in response to Diamond's um, comments or or Peter's thoughts on this? I think I think in my experience, when I've heard people, even in context where I've passed you, who said I I don't see color. I think what they were saying is that I, I don't see color in the sense of making decisions about somebody based on their color. So I, I get that. On the other hand, though, I do see color. And when I see color, it says to me, you have something valuable to offer to me. I can learn something from you just like you can learn something from me. And so I value that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's so good. So, you know, Diamond, you mentioned in uh, in your Facebook post, you mentioned something that I thought really, really <clears throat> hit me. And it's definitely the way that my wife and I have really have tried to raise our kids. But you mentioned the, I don't know if these were your exact words in your post, but it was it was the topic of leading your children away from racism. It was one of your practical tips that you gave us, you know, and that there's there's really no freedom for us in our future if we don't one generation <laughs> at a time teach you know, in a better way. Now, what was interesting to me about this is me knowing you so well, like I know that you're not married, I know that you don't have kids, but I love the fact that your view on this topic was so broad that you were trying to give uh, just good encouragement to the body of Christ and to parents on this issue. So I wanna let you unpack it a little bit more if you'd like to. 
Um, and then I want to go right to you, Dad, because you've 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 done this, right? You've you've raised kids, and then you you know you've also had to break free even from you know some of the way in which you were raised. And so I want to let you, Dad you unpack that a little bit. But Diamond, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. This is one of my favorite points, even though I'm not a parent uh, and I'm not a spouse, um, because because systemically in our country on this soil uh black people have experienced uh somewhere an effect of 420 years of of lawful oppression okay go with me here stay with me mm -hmm. because of that um up until you know the civil rights act i believe the civil rights act of 1964 was specifically for black people and 68 was for native american people um up until 1964 when it became unlawful to discriminate against people who were black the entire makeup of this region was about separating people uh based on their skin color so we're talking about generations of lawful oppression, generations of lawful, like it is literally the law, it is supported by legislation uh, for people of color to be less than. <clears throat> we are never gonna turn this thing around uh, in one generation. We can have as many powerful conversations like this one in our whole lifetime. Like Aaron, you could do this every day for the rest of your life. Me, yeah. Peter, John, we could do this every day for the rest of our lives and it wouldn't put a dent mm -hmm. in what our country has uh, experienced in terms of lawful and systemic oppression of black people. So the solution is to throw out the notion that we will be able to turn this ship around in one generation and we have to start seeing with eyes of generational yeah. um, change zoom out we have yeah. to we have to we have to spread it out because if we're gonna if, if for 400 years we did it one way and the law literally allowed us to do that we yeah. have to expect that for at least the next 400 years we're gonna have to do it a different way yeah and that would be assuming if the day that the civil rights act of 1964 was enacted that every single person linked arms decided that racism was wrong and began to change their behavior but that hasn't even been the case so we've got a lot of work to do and that's where the heart of that specific point came from. I've got to be proactive about teaching my kids about what has been and what needs to be. Hmm. And so does every other person who wants to affect change. And then their kids have to teach their kids and then their kids have to teach their kids. Yeah. And hopefully one day, a couple hundred years from now, there will be a harvest to reap. But we yeah. have to be the generation that's willing to plant seeds of change seeds yeah. of righteousness and so that's where the heart of that specific post part of the post comes from yeah is we're not going to turn this thing around in in in, in one media firestorm you know yeah. in one yeah. news cycle in one generation yeah. um and i think what it means to lead children away from racism is not to just say i'm not racist that's like good that you're not racist and i'm thankful for that but we're hearing more about the movement of anti-racism. What does it mean to, uh, to purposefully and intentionally lead my life in such a way that I am inclusive and celebratory of people who are different than me? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I put in my post that I'm very passionate mm -hmm. about is we've got to get our little kids out of their cul-de-sac. I know that you want your kids to be safe. And I know that you want them to feel like they are a part of a community and that's important hmm. but but if our children only grow up in a neighborhood that is familiar to them and they only grow up around people that look like them we can say we're not racist all we want but we are hmm. going to give birth to another generation that cannot look across the table and see eye to eye with someone who looks different than them simply because we have raised them in a vacuum and so we um when i say we i mean my generation i'm not a parent but if you are a parent, I would appeal to you and I would ask you to find ways to expose your kids to other neighborhoods, to take them so and experience authentic cuisine at different restaurants, 
I would ask you to, I would ask you to find a way to sacrifice and travel with your kids, not just, you know, for short term missions trips, but just get them right. out, get them out of their neighborhood. Um, right. I would ask you to, um, to, to, to have conversations with your little kids um, about, uh, about differences in other cultures so that they grow up not just okay or not just comfortable with different people, but yeah. excited and celebratory of different cultures and that. um you know and i don't know just loving all people because that's what they were taught to do not because mm -hmm. it's their default setting does that yeah. make sense i love it it's so good um let me just say this before i dad give you a chance to speak to the same you know topic of leading your children away from racism if you're just logging on this is ltg live uh, my name is aaron my co-host is peter reeves and we're having a, an important conversation today um, and we're excited that you've joined us. Uh, we would love it if you uh, love the conversation. Go ahead and like it. Go ahead and share it so that more people can be a part. Uh, today we have two guests with us. First time Peter and I have ever done this. We have Diamond Yampert as well as my father, John Holt. And uh, we're talking racism today and having a really profound conversation about it. Um, and right now, if you've just logged in the last couple of minutes, we're talking specifically about something Diamond wrote in her Facebook post and one specific piece where she said, lead your children away from racism. So dad, I wanted to give you a chance to unpack that as well from your perspective as a father uh, who's raised uh, three kids uh, and your perspective growing up in the generation in which you did. Well, first I want to say, uh, Diamond, I loved your post. And then secondly, I want to say, I, I really loved your comment about uh, planting the seeds of righteousness because it it is a heart issue and it has to be approached from what we plant in the hearts of those that we are mentoring, coaching, raising, uh, whatever it may be. So in, in, vein, in that vein, let me say that my, my father, uh, what he planted in my heart were seeds of suspicion and fear of anybody who was different. Now, being different ne didn't necessarily mean being a person of color or being black. It could have meant being Catholic. So I heard all kinds of stories uh, mm. about that, which created a lot of fear and suspicion. I heard stories about Jews and, you know, what they were like. And then, of course, I heard stories about black people and, mm. and, and unfortunately, uh, words and jokes and things like that, that really depreciated the value of people who were different from us. Uh, so, that, that was challenging, you know, to overcome that because I was never introduced to anybody who was different from me until I was probably about 12 years old and we had moved to a, a part of the city of Reading that was more diverse. And, but then it, with my interactions with people of color, I was coming from that mindset of suspicion hmm. and fear. And I realized that and, and I came to realize this over the years of growing and my interactions with diverse people in all kinds of settings, that they also have some suspicions and fears of people like me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I would think, well, what am I to be afraid of? But I, I understand, again, it's what's planted in the heart. And, yeah. and when the seeds of righteousness are not planted there, then the other kind of things, you know, come, come to the forefront. So... Uh, I had to overcome that, and at times, even as a young adult, uh, whether it was in Bible college or raising my own children, I was embarrassed by things. Not my mother. My mother was more open to all kinds of people, but I was embarrassed by things my father would say. Uh, huh. And 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 my, my dad wasn't a person that you could speak a whole lot of correction to. So... <laughs> You know, you grimaced and then you tried to correct that with your children later on if they heard their grandfather say something that he shouldn't have said. Um, yeah. So those were challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, I'm wondering, uh, you know, you're you're a new dad, right? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. <laughs> Talk to us. Yeah, I think um, I think your daily dose of BT isn't enough. Uh, which is black entertainment television, uh, <laughs> you know, turning that on uh, for a few. You could watch The Proud Family back in the day. Shout out to the 90s with your family as much <laughs> as you want. It ain't going to work. I think 
I think the problem goes beyond what we do intentionally. I think there's an unconscious, um, uh, unconscious feeling or spirit that that uh, roams and rages throughout the earth, talking about. Uh, like where people do things unconsciously and that, that gets passed on to their kids. Like where they see a black man walk across the street and they lock their door. See, that's what I'm talking about when, uh, you know, that when they pull into a, a different type of neighborhood and, and mom sits up a little straight. It's those little things that our children pay attention to. And I'm learning that. Uh, the other day, I realized that when I go up the stairs, I groan. I go, ha, 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 Rob, get up the stairs. And my two-year-old, I, I said, get up the stairs. And she started groaning. And I was like, who taught her that? And Jordan was like, what do you mean who taught her that? You taught her that. And I was like, oh, like I got to get up the stairs with some energy. Anyway, it, it, it's, that, it's that, uh, that thing, though, that our children are looking at, that, they, that they're attached to that we don't even see. And yeah. so I, I think it happens in... Uh, in several different ways, the kind of, I would say one of the biggest things in leading your children away from racism is the kind of people you bring into your home. Mm. That is what, that is mm. what, because I can take you all the places I want to take you. Diamond, I love what you said about ethnic cuisine. Let's That's do good. it. But Come until on. I bring you I'm into ready. my like place right of now, safety, let's go. <laughs> right, until no. I bring you into my place of safety, That's good, Peter. where I'm yeah. supposed yeah. to be yeah. called off, you know, where yeah. all the, the barriers are off and I engage with you in a way that my children can say, this is valuable. That, yeah. That's when things start to change. Because yep. anybody can do something outside their house, but it's inside your home. Well, if they see me treat you differently than the way, I mean, scripture talks about this, right? In terms of, uh, in terms of what we see on opulence and wealth in a person. If you treat someone with a lot of wealth in a place of honor, but then you cast the downside. I think it's the same thing for race. If my children see me treat someone different than the way I treat, you know, another person of a different color of what sort, yeah. they catch on to that. They pick on that. Mm -hmm. And as a new parent, I'm realizing that it's not it's not the intentional mm -hmm. uh, conscious things that my daughter is catching. It's the unconscious things that I'm not paying attention to that she's doing. She holds the remote just like I hold it. Didn't think about it. She goes up the stairs like I go up the stairs. She holds her cup the way I hold the cup. Right. She She responds to my wife the way I respond to my, I didn't even know how I was responding, but when she responds, <laughs> I, I had noticed that's wrong. That's what yeah. I'm talking about when, when I think yeah. Diamond's saying too, when yeah. she's saying lead your children away from racism. So that's so good. That's so good. There's, a, there's so many good comments, um, you know, coming in here, guys. And, you know, just a shout out, you know, to Carrie Brooks and Chili Chilton. He said the cool, couple, some cool things about both you, Diamond and Peter. So you, shout out to you. I love you, buddy. Casey Douglas. Um, Love you, you know, uh, we'd love we'd love to take some of your questions on the chat. And so if you're if you're watching right now, go ahead and pop a question in the chat and we'll, we'll put it up and we'd love to tackle some of those things. And uh, if you like what you're hearing right now, consider uh, liking it and sharing it. Go to the Lead the Generation Facebook page uh, and you can click on the like button and that will always keep you notified for yeah. every single week who we're going to be interviewing and what our topic is. So I want to I want to direct all three of you to another question here. And Diamond, this wasn't necessarily something that you specifically said in your post. Um, your Facebook post, but it did trigger this thought in me as a leader in the church world. And all all four of us are leaders in the church world. We lead in different ways. Um, um, you know, Peter, you're a full time youth pastor right now. Dad, you are a, a retired lead pastor with over 45 years of lead pastor experience, but you're interim and, and, and still leading and coaching. Diamond, um, you're working uh, for Quicken right now, but you're still highly involved um, in your local church as well as highly involved in the ministry of Lead the Generation. And so I want you to process what's happening here in our world from that context of church leadership and, and, uh, and, and how the Bible would instruct us to lead. So here's the question I'd love for you guys to process with us. Um, how does our biblical understanding of vicarious repentance apply to the topic of racism, right? And we've seen this, we see this pattern in the Bible. We see, we see biblical leaders that vicariously repent for the sins of previous generations or for the sins of other people, although it might not necessarily be their sin. And, and so I'm interested to get all of your perspective on this. I just wanted to ask the question and let the three of you kind of dissect it a little bit. Um, uh, we could probably spend the rest of our time together just talking on this one, <laughs> this one question right here. But I think it's so important. I'll, I'll make one quick comment and then just whichever one of you wants to jump in, you can jump in. And, and that is that, that I think I, 
as well as many other leaders, um, one of the mistakes we've made specific to this topic, the topic of racism, is that we've said, I'm not racist. And, and in doing that, at times, we have absolved ourselves of any responsibility for what is happening in our culture or in our world that is racist and, and in the eyes of God is sinful, right? And so, so where, does, where does your understanding of this come into play? How do you process this? What are some practical things that you could recommend for church leaders of all different kinds and contexts and backgrounds that are watching and listening right now? I have some thoughts, but I think I want to hear, uh, John, would you mind? Just because no, you are a generational leader and I, I, I don't want to start. I want you to okay. start. So uh, when Aaron was asking that question, my mind, of course, immediately went to Daniel. I think it's Daniel chapter 10 or 11, where he repents on behalf of all the Jewish people and cries out to God. And he confesses all the things that they have, they have done. Uh, so that's a, that's a great model. Uh, for us, but but then you know beyond that to say okay wh what what can I do as a leader? So when I look back on my experiences in Pittsburgh and then in the Greater Philadelphia area, uh, I I realized that I, I had to focus on what I could do, not what I couldn't do, because mm. there's just a whole lot of things that you look at and say I can pray about that, but I'm not in a position to do anything about that. And then I could just sit back and say, like Aaron said, well, I'm not racist, so it, it's, it's a non-issue. But it is an issue. And when we were in Pittsburgh, uh, we were connecting with uh, Reconcilers Fellowship, uh, Spencer Perkins. I, uh, Spencer Perkins is uh, now in heaven. I think Recon Reconcilers Fellowship uh, has probably closed. But at that time, it was a very viable ministry. And it was helping uh, God's people, uh, speaking into the culture of that day. So that helped me as a pastor uh, to look and say, here's some things I can do. I can connect with uh, this organization. Uh, their resources will help us as a church. That will help us in the community uh, that we're in. Uh, so... Uh, again, I think that I, I believe that biblical repentance has to lead to some action. Hmm. It, it can't just be words that I say. It ha it, just like faith has to lead to action. So right. if, if I've repented, that isn't just words. That, that means there's something that I am doing. So as a pastor, I had to look and embrace and say, so what can I do? Hmm. Uh, I, I can't do, like I said, there's things that I can't do everything, but I can do something. So what is the something that God wants me to do in my setting? And, and that's, that's how I began to approach that when I was, when I was serving in urban settings. I, and I'll just, I'll add some context because I think this is such an interesting part of my dad's ministry journey. The first two churches my dad pastored at were like all country white little churches and then God called him to go to Pittsburgh and be an inner city pastor. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, hey, okay. And I was like, God, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, Diamond nor Peter, go ahead, jump in on this question about um, vicarious repentance and how we as church leaders should be responding. You know, I, John, I love what you said. I actually have a, a portion of scripture from uh, Daniel's lamenting prayer uh, in chapter 9 on behalf of the city of Babylon on my back. It was my very wow. first tattoo. Okay. Uh, I recognized that he took on the sins of his people. And even as a young person, I think I was 17 years old when I got this tattoo. I don't know, I don't wanna be like spooky, but I feel like it was almost prophetic that I knew that someday I was gonna have to take on, um, I was gonna have to put on almost like a backpack or a weight. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it was about uh, serving the city of Detroit and us having a renaissance and us having a revival. But I think that there's a similar thing happening in the black community and specifically uh, among uh, our Christians as well, among our churches and in the, in, the, in the bride of Christ. I think that it is really, really, really hard always, no matter what the context is, to take responsibility for something that you didn't personally do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody out there is an older sibling, like, mm -hmm. And you and your younger siblings have ever done something, and then your parents came for you because you were supposed to be the responsible one. Yeah. You know, or if you were ever uh, in student government in school, and uh, maybe you and a small group of people 
were expected to be the voice and to be the influencers of your peers. There was like a weight on you to take on responsibility, even if you didn't necessarily do something wrong. It is not in our human nature to take action or take responsibility when I, like, why are you slapping me on the wrist when I didn't do it? That was four right. generations ago. That yeah. seems to be the, um, the, the, a large majority of people who have a hard time acknowledging that racism is still here because they're saying, right. well, I'm not racist and right. my spouse isn't racist and my kids aren't racist. Yeah. And yeah, like our grandparents are kind of like, you know, they're prejudiced or they're racist, you know. Um, but we're, we're not, that's not us. Mm -hmm. So because we haven't done anything wrong, we don't have to take responsibility. And I would just appeal to, um, I know I say that a lot, but that is my, 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 uh, my posture is an appeal. I'm just asking, hmm. I'm just asking you to consider, uh, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christ follower, that our righteousness and our, our salvation does hold us to a higher standard. And there will be times that we have to take responsibility for things that we didn't personally do right. in order for there to be, John, seeds of righteousness planted. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe if you're out there and you're having a really hard time with the echo chamber of social justice on your timeline, um, I would just ask you to consider that we would take responsibility for this conversation and moving it forward and seeing generations liberated from uh, from the pain and the chains of oppression uh, and systemic racial divides, uh, because it's our responsibility to clean it up even if we didn't make the mess. Not because mm -hmm. I'm black or because I'm white, but because I'm saved. Yeah, That's what I would say. Um, there's people out there that are telling me, you know, it's not your responsibility as a black person uh, to be the voice of your people. I know, I know, and I appreciate that, and you're right. But I'm not doing this because I'm black. I'm doing it because I'm saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't post that on social media just because I was black. I did it because I'm also saved. And mm -hmm. my salvation and the grace that I've received mm -hmm. in Christ has given me, allows me to see this thing through a couple of lenses, not just the lens of being a hurting, heartbroken black woman in, in, in Detroit, but through the lens of also being saved by grace and wanting our generations to have, have freedom uh, from what we see and what we're experiencing. So that's what I would say um, on the topic of vicarious repentance. Just because you didn't do it doesn't mean you don't have to clean it up. That's what happens when we uh, uh, are uh, held to a bit of a higher standard. And I'm grateful for that. I signed up for that so when good. I signed up to walk with Jesus. So. Yeah. Right. right. Do you know Let how many times as a leader I have said sorry for something I didn't do? Um, <laughs> that's it. Like, right. like that, that is what we're called to do. Like that's when right. it goes well, it's everyone else is doing a great job but when it goes wrong it's like hey this is on me i apologize do you know mm -hmm. how many people who have been abused that i've apologized to them on behalf of their father who i've never met before i, mm -hmm. I was talking to a young man who who said to me the other day he said i don't understand like uh i i don't understand lineage and why i'm connected to what the decision that my grandparents made and so they said to me they said you know like you talk about july 4th and how you know, that you, you don't love to celebrate it because at that time, like that freedom wasn't for black people. Like mm. that freedom was for a lot of people, uh, but it wasn't for yeah. black people. And uh, they said, well, why are you upset that, why are you upset that, that at that time black people weren't free, but uh, like, why are you upset that black people weren't free at that time? And why can't you celebrate? And I said, for the same reason why you didn't have anything to do with the freedom of this nation, but you still light fireworks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you're still cooking hot dogs. You're like, this is amazing, American flag. And I'm like, I love this nation and, and I love who we are. I, I just think that, especially, you know, as Christians and as leaders, like Damien was saying, like we're, we're called to reflect the kingdom of, of our God. And uh, this is a God that is indefinitely sees in high definition images. Uh, he created color. And uh, I even draw, draw back to that story of Joseph, who was a type of Christ clothed in many colors, that coat of many colors. It, it's something that God, that we are responsible for to see, to acknowledge, hmm. uh, to, to celebrate. And so I think repentance, uh, again, leads to action. And so on, let me just go ahead and say this. Now. Oh, this is good, Peter. This oh, is where it gets kind of dangerous is a lot of solutions that church leaders, both white and, 
and black are talking about to me seem temporary. Because it's not just about you getting your church out to go in the streets and protest. It's about getting black people on your staff. All right, now. It's about creating (laughs) permanent solutions to the decisions and the situations that we're talking about. It's not just about uh, aiding the moment or bandaging bandaging this situation. Somebody asked me, they said, well, at, at this time, why do you think... Why do you really think that all of this is exploding now when it's been happening, you know, for so long? And I said, well, I think it's happening right now because people are saying we were supposed to be going in the same direction. But all Mm. of a sudden, I feel like you're against me. Mm. And as Christian leaders, we have to stand up and say, I'm sorry. I'm responsible. I'm here with you. Because anyway, before I start preaching, but just I need you to know that (laughs) repentance requires action, not just temporary action, permanent action that's actually going to give people the opportunity to grow and go beyond uh, where we're at right now. I love what Diamond said. If you want to do something, support black businesses. If you want to do something, stop making the jokes. If you want to do that post was on. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So good. So I think it's family day here on LTG Live because we're all family. Because, uh, yes. you know, one of you is my dad and the other two of you I consider spiritual daughter and spiritual son, right? But I, you're there's my a, the, brother. And that and, yeah, you guys are my brother. Right. Okay. So, but I say that because uh, my uncle Ron is listening today and he uh, posted a great question that I'm going to throw up on the screen here and let the three of you guys tackle this. Uh, so he says this and uh, he says, should local church leadership in our cities be reaching, attempting to engage leaders of protest groups around the nation and government officials, mayor and police boards, etc., to choose an organized dialogue aimed at remediation, reconciliation, and restoration over continuing protests that clearly are vulnerable to being hijacked by forces of darkness? Um, my uncle's a lawyer, so that's why there's so many big words in there. Uh, so. I, love the word. I love words, Ron. I yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Person someday, but I love this question. Yes. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Let's tackle I, it. I love this question. Um, let me take it piece by piece. Okay. Uh, should our local church leaders in their communities be trying to? engage the leaders of people who are protesting all over the place and the government officials so that we can come to i think we just lost diamond for a second Mm. yeah can you hear me no we got you back go ahead keep going okay um should we be trying to as church leaders engage the protest leaders and the government officials to come together and have a conversation specifically on the topic of the protests that are kind of also being hijacked um, by these other groups. Um, I have a couple of things to say. I'll do my best to be concise. I believe that it is the responsibility and I tread lightly because I'm not a lead pastor yet. And I I know. um, I love that that you said yet. I just want to say that. I love that you said yet. (laughs) You know, you know how I roll. Anybody I know, on the chat who knows me in person knows how I roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm uh, with you. know what it is. Um, I'm not a lead pastor yet. Um, and I I don't ever want to sit where I sit and scrutinize what I believe is one of the hardest jobs um, ever to lead a to lead a flock, to be a shepherd, and to do that as your um as your as your job. But I do want to ask you to consider if you are a church leader that we in the church always seem to be kind of like pulling up a chair to these crucial conversations a few minutes after they start and going like, hey, what did I miss? Hmm. And I don't think that that was God's heart for when he asked, when when, when the local church uh, was designed in his mind um, and began to come together and meet. I believe that the goal was that church leaders would be influential. And we wouldn't be pulling up a table or pulling up a chair um, and trying to join a conversation and get caught up. I believe we are supposed to be building the table, setting the table, and gathering the other voices in the community and then mediating the conversation, much like what you're doing with this conversation, E, with us. I believe that that is part of the job of the local church leader, of the shepherd, is to gather the other influential voices and mediate the conversation through a lens of biblical truth. Hmm. And because we are always arriving late to these conversations, a lot of times we are losing our credibility against the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. So when you talk wow. about 
these forces, these people that are inspired by dark things that are coming in and hijacking uh, the voices of the oppressed in their protests and turning these protests into riots and turning these, dem turning these demonstrations into demolitions of local businesses, hmm. we are having a very hard time driving out the forces of darkness because we're not starting the conversation. Hmm. We're yes. not setting That's the so table. Yeah. So we're showing wow. up a week and a half later, nine days later, and posting uh, some, you know, some some vague banner uh, of we hate hate, and then like some vague scripture, and then like letting people uh, make of what they want of it. I I think that we can't be surprised that people aren't asking the church right now to mediate hmm. these conversations because as local church leaders, we're oftentimes a day late, a dollar short, hmm. and just trying to catch up and not offend anybody when we do enter these difficult conversations. If you're a pastor and you're listening to this right now, I would ask you um, as a pastor's kid, as a pastor, um, as someone who would like to be a leader in my community and be a part of the reconciliation and repair of the city of Detroit, um, I would ask you that in your communities, would you set a table for people to come and have a conversation? Would mm -hmm. you would you begin to posture yourself as somebody that people look to to say, "That's a sound mind. That's scriptural. That's that's that person is 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 slow to speak and slow to anger." I want to have a conversation with them. Peter talked about how repentance leads to action. But I think it's Roman two, Romans 2 that talks about, from the character of God, kindness is what leads to repentance. Mm -hmm. And so if we would be able to kindly and gracefully and peacefully set a table for people to have these conversations and get there first for once, mm -hmm. I believe that we would have much more authority <laughs> over the kingdom of darkness that tries to hijack the voice of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really long way to say, yeah, if you're a lead pastor, get involved and don't do it late. Yeah. So that. good. All right. So let me, before dad and before Peter, you guys jump on that same question. Let me just welcome. We got a lot of people watching, a lot of people chatting right now. Welcome to LTG Live. Uh, if you missed part of the conversation earlier, you can catch it on the YouTube channel or on the podcast. Those will be posted. And uh, if you want to be a part of more conversations like this, go on our Facebook page, Lead the Generation, click on the like. If you love this conversation, like this, share this. Here's the question that we're tackling uh, right now as we're going through this. We're tackling a question from uh, Ron Hold on how church leadership should be engaging uh, in the process of remediation, reconciliation, and restoration over a lot of the rioting that is happening. And so that's what Diamond was just unpacking her views on that. Um, Dad, Peter, whichever one of you, I think both of you probably have some things to say, but go ahead and jump in on this. Well, let me jump, let me jump in uh, and my... My thought has to do with influence. Uh, we all have a sphere of influence. There are lead pastors who have nationwide influence. Uh, I don't have that. My sphere of influence has actually been decreased in, in this particular season of my life. So I don't have the greater sphere of influence. But from my perspective of having pastored for 30 years in urban settings and trying to provide leadership uh, as a lead pastor and addressing issues that needed to be addressed regarding racism, uh, I I realized that there there's a lot of pressure on the person who is the lead pastor. And many times I, I felt like, you know what, no matter what I do here, there's going to be somebody who says it's not right or it's not enough or you shouldn't have done it or you should have done it sooner. And and so you, you deal with a lot of those pressures as a leader and you have to come back, for me to come back to say, well, I, I believe I'm doing what God wants me to do and I need to speak what God wants me to speak, but I know that not everybody's gonna be happy about it. And my my calling is not to make everybody happy with me. So my, my, hmm. my, my, my calling <laughs> is to en endeavor, you know, to speak forth the truth and to speak it in love. But see, one of the, one of the things, and, li and listening to Diamond talk about this, I realized that for me as a lead pastor, and, I, and I've heard this phrase, and probably you've all heard it too, is that you get what you teach. Mm. 
So if, if I am not engaging in teaching my people what they need to know about the heart of God when it comes to this issue mm. and reconciliation, if I'm, if I'm not engaging my mm. people in wrestling with truth, I'm not going to get the fruit that yeah. I want to see. Mm. It, it can't just be because yeah. I'm the lead pastor and I says this is the wrong way to think and this is the right way yeah. to think. I, right. I, I can't change hearts, but the Word of God and the Spirit of God can do that. Yeah. So then I have to, as a pastor, look and say, what do I need to be teaching my people that is going to help them to make a difference in their sphere of influence? So mm. my sphere of influence may be a congregation of 400 people, but those 400, they have thousands of people that they're impacting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we we ha we have to we we just have to start with where we're at, mm. and say, okay, here's where I'm at. Here are the people I can influence. How does God want me to do it? What do I need to teach them? What do I need to model? Uh, what are the challenges that may be uncomfortable for them, but I need to do it anyway. I need to speak mm. it or the action mm. that I need to take. That not everybody is going to pat me on the back and say, "Hey, great job, Pastor." Mm, uh, so and, good. And and that's and that's part of our calling. That, yeah. that just is is the way it is. So I used to say, "It'd be nice if everybody loved me, but it's not necessary." <laughs> I can still I can still do my job even if everybody doesn't love me. I love that. <laughs> I said I said to a youth pastor I was coaching last week, "If you want everyone to love you, stop being a leader and go give away exactly. ice cream." Like yeah. that's that's yeah. just the way it works. Ice cream. Uh, Peter, I want to give you a chance to speak yeah. to this. I think what Diamond said and both John said, it was excellent, especially the part about setting the table. I love that imagery. Um, and I, I don't have much more to say except on that word hijacked, hijacked by the forces of darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the reason that these protests have the ability to even be hijacked is because people of, by the force of darkness is because people of light haven't been present. You know, like mm. people like darkness on, has on, always Peter. been subservient to light. Light, uh, it, 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 uh, um, I'm sorry, it just it moves the lightness or the darkness. It exhausts yeah. the darkness out of the place. So it's like for, for these protests to be hijacked by people so easily, it's because the people of God haven't stood in position Come and on. allowed themselves to be strong and Come to on. communicate and direct the crowd. I believe there's a, a riot there because there's an absence of peace. And when we read scripture, we, we find Find out that true peace actually brings true authority to a situation and so the lack of authority that causes these riots to happen is because the people who have the most peace aren't present Come so on. so <laughs> absolutely we have to join with them we have to be a part of the conversation we have to not just be leading the conversation but allowing people to speak in a way that truly brings light to the conversation mm. then they couldn't be so easily uh, hijacked by darkness. that's kind of my that's thought. so yeah. good that's it. So That's it. let me let, let's take this question. This is this is from Chris McNanny. He's a youth pastor here in Pennsylvania, and um, Chris said this. He says, "Can you talk about the role of equity in this process? Is it part of the journey to justice or a substitute?" I think a lot of people are confused about that stuff. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, great question. Great question, Chris. I'm great wondering. question, Chris. I'm digesting. Yeah digest yeah i know you know this is one of those ones you're like all right let me just hey everyone we're gonna take five minutes to think about this um go get yourself some popcorn and come best. back yeah, yeah. Um, i'll keep it short there is a difference between equity and equality and there is there will there will be no there will be no substitute um for our journey to justice there will be no substitute incredible question Chris, mm. this is going to be long. This is going to be hard. And this is something I want to encourage all of you who are trying to figure out what is your next step? Where, where can you take action? Where, who is right? Who is wrong? You do realize that we haven't overcome racial inequality yet. So there is no playbook. There is no code of conduct. There is no um, predetermined correct way to uh, one of my mentors and my a spiritual father to me, Eric, is watching right now. He said something to me over dinner last week that has completely changed my view of all of these racial inequality conversations. He said, you know, can I can I suggest to you that there is no such thing as racial reconciliation? Because reconciliation would 
would suggest that at one point, hmm. people of all color, at least here, have been able to walk together arm in arm and that we at one point were broken apart and now we are trying to come back together. But we were never together to begin with. Hmm. We have gotten better. But there is no reference point uh, to a place in history. I mean, besides like the garden, but there were like two people and a snake there and an apple. So <laughs> there's not like, we don't have a reference point for the last time that we were able to live in harmony when it comes to the color of our skin and our cultural beliefs. And so even the concept of reconciliation and coming back together is like kind of a flawed conversation. Mm. Uh, so I would just, to refer to Chris's um, question and to try to keep it on topic, uh, the role of equity in this process, I would, I would say is, <sighs> it is part of the journey I love what Maddie just said in the comments. We have never seen this future. That's beautiful. Mm. Um, it is part of the journey and there are many moving parts and there is no playbook. There is no schematic. There is no code of conduct because we've never done it before. Mm. Uh, so continue to be confused, continue to press in, continue mm. to read books, continue to ask your friends really awkward questions. Um, mm. Continue to like Peter said, invite people into your home. Like I went over to Eric's house last week and we sat and ate out back at his kitchen table for four hours while I pretty much just ranted because of, uh, of how heavy everything has been and how much I want to be a part of, uh, of change. I would encourage mm. you to just keep being confused, keep asking mm. questions, keep being curious uh, and keep having a deep desire um, to, to find answers, but knowing that it's probably not gonna be easy and it might not even happen in your lifetime. I think that will give you a lot of peace um, in knowing that we don't have it all figured out, um, but we're gonna get there. I hope that's helpful. Um, guys, add on to what I'm saying. It's a great question, Chris. So if I, if I could respond to that, uh, I believe theologically that reconciliation is the heart of God. Uh, and so I, in going all the way back, Diamond, like you did to say to the garden, you know, uh, Paul says in Acts, from one man he made every nation, you know, yeah. uh, under the planet. So God's heart is for reconciliation. We just don't have a picture of what that would look like in, in our nation and in our context. Yeah. But from the heart of God, we do have a picture because to me that means that I'm going to bless, I'm going to honor, I I'm going to edify, I'm going to support, I'm going to encourage uh, people of you know, other ethnicities, because we're all a part of, you know, God's creation, and we have something of value to give to one another. Uh, mm. I, I think I think the heart of reconciliation, when, when you read what Paul has to say in Second Corinthians 5 about this, we have something we're calling people to. You know, God is calling us to himself, so we have something we're calling people to. And we might not have the complete picture, like Diamond said, you know, that there's, yeah, there's some mystery involved in this. There's unknowns mm -hmm. involved in this. But it, if we're willing to respond to the heart of God, then he can help us to see what should I be doing in my context. And it might be different from what you should do in yours. But this is the heart of God. It's hmm. good. Yeah. So no good. thoughts on that, my man. That <laughs> Peter's like, I'm good. Great I'm <laughs> 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 we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do one more question. I mean, um, we could talk. I know, especially with uh, this group here, we could talk for a, a quite a long time. For those of you that have just been, just joined us, maybe in the last couple minutes, this has been a a, a profoundly impacting yet practical conversation uh, on racism what has uh, not only been happening in our country the last several weeks, but has been happening for generations. And I appreciate each of you, Dad, Diamond, uh, Peter, being on here and just sharing uh, just just such a biblical, strong biblical perspective on this issue. And uh, if you missed some of the conversation, uh, this will go up on our YouTube channel uh, here in the next couple of days. We'll post a link for that, uh, as well as Peter and I's podcast. Peter and I had just a couple of weeks ago a conversation with Austin Westlake on racism. It's another great resource uh, that's available right now on our podcast or on our YouTube page as well. 
So uh, let, let's tackle one more question here, Diamond. This comes directly from the Facebook post um, that you wrote several uh, weeks ago. Um, and uh, so let me just ask you this question and let, let, uh, let you unpack this and Peter as well. Tell us why it's important in your view for white people to be willing to say black lives matter. I, I, thank you for asking this question. Um, there has been a, a great deal of walking on social eggshells around the uh, around the statement Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and I would absolutely. like to give you just some context for it. I want to uh, gracefully correct anyone who believes that Black Lives Matter is a radical movement. Uh, just like anything that has power, uh, people of all the de- ideologies will attach themselves to it. But Black Lives Matter uh, was simply a statement attached to a hashtag. So if you are uh, uh, on social media, you understand that hashtags are just uh, simply statements that link or uh, give a theme to a conversation. And then when you click on that hashtag, it will bring up maybe like or related responses from many other people that may not follow one another, but have a shared ideal. Uh, the Black Lives Matter hashtag uh, began to circulate uh, as a result of a conversation from three, one, three young black women. Uh, many other people began to repost and use that hashtag to, uh, to link their conversations together to create a, a greater conversation, which I do believe is the, the, the great power in social media, is being able to have an ongoing conversation with many other people that you, you don't necessarily know, Diamond, are you with us? There you are. Can you hear me? We got you back now. Yeah. Since that time, a movement has emerged that has uh, resulted uh, in an organization of sorts. Um, But not every person that uses the Black Lives Matter hashtag is aligning themselves with uh, an official organization. They're just trying to contribute to that original conversation from those three young Black women who wanted to make a statement that Mm. Black Lives Matter. There's an important invisible word after Black Lives Matter uh, that if this statement makes you uncomfortable, I think I can provide you some comfort. What the statement actually means is Black Lives Matter too, or Black Lives Matter also. But Mm. the two or the also is implied because nobody, I think, uh, who understands the heart of the conversation would, would think that anyone who uses the words black lives matter is saying that only black lives matter. Right. And so if you're uncomfortable with the concept of black lives matter or that hashtag, or anytime you see that statement or you see it on a shirt or you see it in social media or you see it on the news, maybe you are placing the focus on the wrong invisible word. Maybe you think that it's saying only black lives matter. And I just want to gently correct you. It's not saying only black lives matter. It's saying black lives matter too. Um, And the reason we have to say this is because of our climate and because of the um, incredible number of black men and women who have died or been brutalized at the hands of systemic racial injustice. We're not just talking about police brutality here. We're also talking about incarceration, mass incarceration, uh, and we're talking about the war on drugs. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a big conversation. Nobody is expected to be an expert or to know all of these things, but I just want to provide some context because if you've been uncomfortable with that statement before, uh, maybe it's because of just some bad information and we can get rid of that. We all have a Google machine. We can get rid of bad information. It's pretty, okay. <laughs> so black lives matter. When you say that, what you are sharing with me and any other person who is an ally or a black person is you are saying, I see you. I understand that there is a war on your people. I understand that there are still only 13% of Americans who are black, but 40% of the people that are in our prisons are black. I understand that in in 2019, there there were five times more when you look at the ratios, not the actual numbers, we gotta do some math here, but the ratios of people uh, that died as a a result of police brutality, uh, the number was like, 500% 500% more when right. you compare black people to black to white people. And so when, when you say black lives matter, what you're saying is I see you, I see the pressure and the oppression of your people. I see that it has not been eradicated yet. And I understand that systemically we have come far, but we have an even longer way to go. 
and I will not sit silently while uh, while this continues. I want to be on the right side of this thing. I want to walk with you. And I'm not going to just stick my head in the sand and pretend that the big bad media is trying to sell us things that are not true. Um, so I just, I hope that that's helpful to you. Um, I get passionate when I talk about the topic because there's been a great deal of misunderstanding. Um, and uh, I wanna help people have a great conversation and hashtags allow us to do that. Don't give it more power than it has. It's a hashtag, it's a movement, it's an organization. And it's been very, very powerful, but don't turn it into a God. It's, you know, don't turn it into something evil. Don't turn it into a demon. Don't, you know, turn it into some radicalist movement. Um, it's a conversation and conversations in my belief are what it, what are going to change the world. One by one so people good. who have influence with other people are going to sit down and have conversations and the hashtags may look different. Um, but if you allow me to have a conversation with you, on a topic and that conversation spreads to other people who become illuminated as a result of sharing influence uh, and ideologies with one another. That's how we change the world. That's how we drive our kids away from racism. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how generations to come will not experience systemic racial oppression. Um, it, it happens through conversations and that's what Black Lives Matter was supposed to be and still is. So don't turn it into something it's not. Use it as an opportunity to be an ally with the black community. Yeah, absolutely. I think I so think good. that we have to consider the context in which this statement "Black Lives Matters" w "Black Lives Matter" was the was first said. I think Diamond did a great job explaining that it was said in response to an event. Okay, so this wasn't screamed from the rooftops from a position of dominance. This was said from a position in response to a situation that happened. So and good. I think, and I think when. When we say Black Lives Matter, we're saying it like, like I love that Black Lives Matter too. We're not saying Black Lives only matter. It's only lives that matter. It's in response to what happened. And um, I think when, when you say Black Lives Matter, it, it really is, it really is a, a stance against um, people who are still pushing for real. <laughs> just simply for just white America. And I don't want to say that. Uh, I think that Black Lives Matter puts you on the side, uh, really on the heart of people who are saying, does anyone see us? I love that diamond. And I think, mm. I think too, that we, we have, when you say Black Lives Matter, it's an opportunity for you to get out of your seat, stand up and say, I know what I'm pushing for. And I want you to capture that because because I feel like a lot of people, the reason they feel uncomfortable saying it is because maybe they're not close with black people. Maybe they don't have a lot of black friends. Maybe maybe they're saying, well, I, don't, I just don't want to get in the middle of this conversation. But but si it's not a divided side. It's just this is the way our nation is. These We're talking to people who don't have the heart of God on the inside of them. And so when we stand up and we say something like that, what we're communicating is not just that you're on a side, but that humanity... That that lives are important. The value of every life is important, but black lives are the ones that are attacked in this moment. And we stand with you. Wh wherever the pain is, that's where Jesus is. Jesus mm. is where the people are in pain. And so mm. for us to stand up and say Black Lives Matter, it's saying, hey, we're positioning ourselves to align with the people who are in pain and we're going to stand with them until they feel strong enough to rise, which could never happen. So we're saying it loud in this moment under attack, Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter. It's a big deal for all kinds of people to say, especially white people. And uh, I think I think it, it's more about, I love what Diamond said, breaking down the barriers that cause confusion or chaos as to what it means. But it, it helps us be aligned and unified as a people which is what we were pushing for anyway but felt kind of taken back because because here's what happened to let me just say this we were all going in one direction fighting against the enemy which was COVID-19 right and so here we are all aligned on one side we're running in the right direction and all of a sudden there's three different cases many more that we don't even know about that happened where in an instance a white man or a some kind was was against the black man so it's like well we thought we were running in the same direction and now our people for they're under attack we have to speak to it we have to address it and when you say black lives matter what you're saying is that this demands a conversation this doesn't get to be swept mm. under the rug this isn't not important and we're not going to act like it doesn't exist the conversation must be had so i know that's kind of jumbled up but you i hope you hear what i'm saying it's, good. Good word. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good dad i want to give you a chance to add any thoughts to that or just any thoughts to the greater conversation we're 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 bringing our conversation to a close. And so I want to give you a chance to do that. And then uh, I'm going to ask you, Dad, uh, to close us in prayer. 
uh, today uh, as our, our senior leader on the call and uh, and uh, pray for pray for us pray for our country pray for uh, our, our leaders our church leaders that that feel a tremendous weight of pressure during this time and, and how they lead and how they respond yeah I, I, I really appreciate uh, Diamond and Peter taking time to unpack uh, that for us because I, I believe it does you know bring understanding because it puts it in the proper context and uh, and just as was mentioned earlier that some things get hijacked by the powers uh, of evil you know statements like that can get hijacked too when they're taken out of the context uh, but that's no different than somebody taking a scripture out of context that you mm -hmm. say this is mm -hmm. this is the truth and then somebody took it out of context and used it uh, either for their own agenda or they used it for that which was not the heart of God uh, so mm -hmm. the same thing with that and so I, I, I love that thank you Diamond thank you Peter for just uh, re really unpacking that because uh, that that brought me some understanding and and I think that that's what we all need uh so i'm thankful like last 15 years we spent in philadelphia uh i i had you know a good brother who i could go to and say can you explain this to me i don't understand because yeah. he he was a black american and he could explain things to me that that i had a hard time processing and we need that in our lives and we need conversations like this also so so good. thank you Thank so you. Good. Dad, I'm so, going to ask you to close us in prayer. Okay. And uh, just want to just thank so many of you for being a part today. So many great comments, so many great questions. Just didn't have time to take them all. Diamond, thank you so much um, you, for Diamond. the way that you are leading thank you, thank you. and uh, that, that you are allowing God to use you and your sphere of influence. Peter, thank you for leading in a local church youth ministry and leading well uh, with your students there as well as uh, your own kids that... Uh, that you're raising and uh for those of you that are watching peter and i will be back with you again next week on thursday at noon another guest another great topic and uh, this has been a difficult one but uh, a conversation that's going to continue happening over and over again if you missed a part of this conversation or any of our other episodes feel free to jump on and subscribe to our podcast subscribe to the the youtube channel all the links are there for you in the chat and uh dad thanks so much for being here Thank you. Uh, as your son, I just uh, I'm honored that you would join and be a you, part John. of this and be a part you of this will. conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank uh, you. And John. I think all three of you have brought so much balance and perspective from many different years of experience in many different hey, contexts. Yeah. Uh, if there's anybody out there that wants to talk, you want to DM me. Um, you want to shoot me a message on Facebook or on Instagram. My Instagram handle is on the screen, but if you want to talk on Facebook. Just track me down, um, and uh, if you have any awkward questions that you want to ask or things you need it. clarification on, yeah. uh, let's chat. It takes me a day or two to catch up with my messages, but um, I think I'm all cut off right now, so uh, let's talk. Awesome. Awesome. Please. So good. Dad, close us. Close us in prayer. Thank you. Okay. Father, we just want to thank you. We want to give you praise for uh, this conversation. I thank you for Diamond. I thank you for Peter. I pray blessings upon them, the gifts you've given them, the the uh, the sphere of influence that you've given them. Thank you for that. And, and Lord, just, just taking hold of something that we said earlier in this conversation, I pray that, pray that you will use this conversation to plant seeds of mm. righteousness yeah. in the hearts of all of those who listen and let it bring forth the fruit that you desire in every context that is represented i pray that in the name of jesus amen amen, amen. thanks for being part of ltg live if you love this content give us a like give us a share go to the facebook page lead the generation and like it so that you always know what's coming up next peter as always best looking man on the show sorry dad <laughs> thanks for being my co-host diamond my wife and i love you dearly you, and uh, thank dad you. thank you so much for honoring awesome. us we bless we you guys you. and uh, we'll see you all next week